All right, I'll be here. You can, yeah, I'll be here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So welcome everyone. Here are some vegan truffles for you if you want. Um, so I'm happy to um, tell you we have Chris Grosak from uh, University of Riverside, University of California, Riverside joining us today. They will tell us about univalence. Take it away, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I guess, you know, standard, uh, you've disabled screen sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, you're super fine. Uh, this is how this always goes. Host. You should Aha. be. Okay, let me double check. There's nothing incriminating on my screen. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. So, you know, standard uh, first two minutes of a Zoom talk stuff. Can everybody see the slides? Yep, yep. Okay, awesome. For some reason, this is on the last page of my slides. So let me do this. Okay. Um, okay. So I guess with that out of the way, let's get started. Mm. All right. So, oh, why is it why is it going automatically? Please don't do that. <laughs> Wait. Uh, okay. Hopefully, it won't go automatically. Okay. Cool. So the univalence axiom. Uh, so of course, many thanks to Jake both for the invitation and for their patience while trading emails. Um, I'm traditionally a bit slow at replying to emails, so I appreciate that. Um, I am and, too, so I get it. <laughs> And uh, oops, and a last little caveat. So I have a blog. I'm going to post the slides there. I'm also going to post, there's going to be some references that I bring up. So some, some other talks that I think you might be interested in, some papers that I think you might want to read. Um, and so I'll include links to all those references in the same blog post that I put these slides. Um, so it'll be the top of the blog today. But to future proof it, you can also go straight to the My Talks tag of my blog. OK. <coughs> so with that out of the way. Let's go ahead and get started. So section one, let's just go over a quick review. I'm not sure exactly how comfortable everybody is with dependent types and identity types, and those are going to be super important for everything else we do. So I want to make sure we take a second to chat about them. So the important thing with homotopy type theory and sort of the homotopy type theoretic lens is that everything has both logical content and geometric content. Um, and so everything we do in this talk, and there's also computational content, but I'm going to talk less about that uh, for this talk. Um, and everything we do is going to have both of these contents associated to it. Um, so uh, let's do the thing. Yeah, so hot is about the interplay between the logic and the, and the geometry. So dependent types. Uh, to every point of a type A, we're going to associate an entire type B of A, right? So equivalently, you can think about this as a function which takes a type A and spits out an element of the universe, B of A, where the universe is, of course, the type of all types or the type of all small types, if you're afraid of size issues. OK, so logically, what does this buy us? Well, it tells us that B is a proposition depending on A. So remember, there's this uh, correspondence that you always want to have in the back of your head that types are propositions and programs are proofs. So the fact that we have a type depending on A of type A tells me that I have a family of propositions indexed by uh, this type family. So for instance, I might have the type x is greater than 4, right? or x is at least 4. So x is, x is greater than or equal to 4 by itself doesn't have a truth value. It's not a true or a false. Um, but if you give me a specific x, then, uh, then suddenly it's a proposition. So this is sort of a family of propositions parameterized by the naturals. Um, and so B of 5 is the collection of proofs that 5 is greater than or equal to 4. Because remember, programs inhabiting a type, we want to think of as being proofs of the proposition that that type represents. So B of x is non-empty exactly if x is greater than 4 is provable. And remember, this is sort of the other half of the logical aspect. Being inhabited means you have a proof. So that tells me that my claim is true, or slightly more precisely, that my claim is provable. And if my type is empty, then that means my, my uh, claim is false. OK. So geometrically now, we want to think about what uh, one of these dependent type families means. And we think about B as being a bundle lying over A. So for example, if here my base space is the circle, that's my type A. And B is going to be the torus lying above A. And so to every point in type A, can you guys see my cursor if I like wiggle my cursor around? Yep, yep. OK, lots of knots. Love it. So to every point downstairs of type A, 
we're going to associate an entire fiber upstairs B of A, right? And yeah, um, so for thus, this is going to be a circle bundle and every point above every point of A is going to be a circle upstairs. Okay, so in the previous example, we can view it as a bundle. We can take this geometric example, or sorry, we can take this logical example and view it geometrically. And we get a bundle that looks like this. Um, it turns out that there's exactly one proof uh, that uh, n is greater than four for every n that is actually greater than four. So we're going to get um, singletons over here and we're going to get uh, nothing at all lying above these points because the proposition is false for these points. And so you can think of this logical claim as having some sort of geometric content and vice versa. Okay, um, yeah, there's no proofs so that one is greater than four. Okay, so now, now that we have our dependent types, there's two very natural constructions to consider and this is natural both from the logical angle and the geometric angle. So we have sigma types, which correspond logically roughly to existential quantification. And geometrically, it corresponds to what's called the total space. And we also have pi types, which roughly correspond to universal quantification and global sections, respectively. Um, I forget, how is people's background with algebraic topology? Um, I guess we'll figure out as we go, but um, hopefully, okay, I'm seeing some, some of this. That's awesome, okay. So, so let's look at the sigma type. We want to think about this as being equal to, where I'm putting my equal in quotes because it's not a set, right? It's a type, but I'm going to write it with set builder notation um, just for sort of convenience. We want to think about this as being the type of all pairs X, B, where X is a member of A and B is a member of the fiber, right? So we pick a point downstairs and we also pick a point lying above that point. And so if you're familiar with like the standard definition of like the tangent bundle, so you can think of B of X as being the, the tangent space at X. Now this space is the entire tangent bundle, right? We've, we've glued all of my tangent spaces together um, at every point. Okay, um, so this is not actually a set, like I said, um, but eventually I'll stop writing these little quotations. I'll trust that you all know that these are types and not sets and I'm abusing notation slightly. Um, okay, logically, we can think about this being, being my set of pairs XP, where P is a proof that B of X holds. So uh, this sigma type is non-empty if and only if B of X holds for some X, right? And not only do we know that B of X holds for some X, whoops, but this has computational content, right? It's proof relevant. If you provide me with a proof of sigma X B of X, that necessarily furnishes witnesses X naught of type A and a proof that B of X naught really does hold. So anytime you prove an existential claim in homotopy type theory, at least if you're not proving the mere proposition version, um, but I'm not going to get to that in this talk. Um, but if you're proving some sigma type, you automatically get witnesses to the existential quantifier, um, which is really cool and really handy. Um, okay, so what does this mean geometrically? Well, like I said, it's some sort of a bundle. So if B of X is the fiber over A, then I glue the fibers together, viewing them to collectively as one space. So if you think about B as a type, as a function from A to the universe, you want to think about this roughly as the stalks of some sheaf. So so every point downstairs, we associate some set upstairs or some type upstairs. And this uh, fiber bundle construction, this um, whatever it's called, total space, you want to think about it as being the atoll space associated to the sheaf. So we glue all of my stocks together in such a way that um, everything is compatible. Um, and there's a natural projection of the atoll space down to my base space, where I take XB and I just forget about B. Um, I only remember what my base point was. Okay, um, so what about, uh, what about product types? So I have X of type A, B of X. You wanna think about this as being equal to the, the type of all functions that take an X in type A and give me a B of X, right? So this picks out a proof, whoops, this, or okay, I did the geometric one first. So this picks out a point from each fiber, right? Or you can think about it as picking out a proof for each X. And so this pi type holds if and only if B of X holds for every X. Um, and again, there's some sort of bonus computational content. Not only do I know that a proof exists for every X, but F gives me a uniform way of finding that proof, right? So somehow um, it, it's more constructively nice because um, not only do I know yeah, there, there's a uniform method of proof, right? F gives me, um, if you give me an X, I can always give you, um, I can always give you a proof that B of X holds. Um, and geometrically, what does this mean? Well, geometrically, this is a section of the fiber bundle. 
to every point downstairs, I associate a point upstairs, right? That lies above it. And so you can think about this as being a global section of the fiber bundle. Yeah, exactly. So it's a section of the natural projection function uh, from the total space to the base space. Um, and notice this is automatically continuous. So um, I'm not going to talk a ton about this in this talk, but one of the things that's nice about homotopy type theory is the fact that we can only write down continuous maps. Um, and this is true the more you categorify as well. So we can only write down functors, um, you know, things like that. And so this is some instantiation of the constructive plane that gets touted all the time that um, uh, whatever it is, uh, constructively, there are no discontinuous functions, right? That's a claim due to Brouwer that has, you know, a handful of different ways you could interpret it, uh, some of them more true than others. Um, but this is one way that it really is true. The only things that we can construct in this language are continuous functions. So we automatically get continuity of our section. Okay. So here's a quick exercise. There's going to be a handful of exercises throughout the talk in case you're looking through the slides later and want to like have fun. So they're also going to be starred based on how difficult I think the exercise is going to be. So this is one star. It should be fairly polite. So find a term of type A times for all AP of A goes to there exists an AP of A. So again, this is some souped up version of the fact that for non-empty A, um, universal quantification or universal quantifiers are stronger than existential quantifiers. Um, but it might be fun to think about what the geometric content of this claim is. I will say, don't think too hard. It's nothing like super enlightening, but it's, it's good to get in the habit of doing that. Okay, so moving on. I guess uh, now is maybe a good point to like take a second pause for breath. Do people have questions about uh, anything we've done so far, dependent types? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of head shaking, so let's move on. Uh, identity types, these are often called path types as well. So remember, we wanna think of types as propositions and programs as proofs. So if A and B have type A, we can ask if A equals B. That's a question, that's a proposition. So it should be a type. So if A and B have type A, then A equals B is a type. And a proof P of type A equals B is a witness or a proof that these two points really are equal. Uh, and REFL A is the canonical witness of reflexivity. So there's always a proof that A equals itself called reflexivity. Now, um, it is consistent, and this is like a, a cute little warning to keep in the back of your head. It's consistent that these are the only proofs of equality. So this is called axiom K. Um, so if you don't have univalence, um, then it's possible that REFL is the only way that things can be equal. Um, however, as soon as you add univalence, there are going to be uh, things that are equal, but not uh, judgmentally equal. So equal, but REFL is not the proof. Um, so this is a good thing to keep in the back of your head. And I think this is one of the reasons why path induction and identity types in general are confusing to beginners, um, because the computational content is a little bit harder to wrap your head around, because sort of it's consistent that the only paths are REFL. So anytime you're proving stuff by path induction, you can just check it for REFL and you magically get um, sort of proofs that look at their face to be much more general. Um, this is part of the magic of homotopy type theory. And I think that one of the reasons it's so hard to think about is because of this consistency statement. It's sort of analogous to the fact that it's difficult to think of non-standard models of, or non-standard numbers and non-standard models of PA because you can't actually get your hands on any, right? It's consistent that they don't exist. So sort of provably they're hard to think about. Um, that's maybe more philosophical, but um, it's something that I um, wanted to include. Um, thankfully, there's been a lot of great research lately uh, by Dan Lakeda and others um, trying to find computational content for not only paths, but also for the univalence axiom itself. Um, so the paths that are given to us by univalence. So with this in mind, I think um, sort of the next generation of homotopy type theorists are going to have a much easier time conceptualizing path types because suddenly there are things that you can get your hands on and that you can compute with. So that's really cool. Okay. So what do these mean geometrically? I've already sort of spoiled things a little bit. P of type A equals B, we can think of as a path from A to B in A. So that path might be super chaotic. So here's my space A, it's like a genus two surface. And you know, there's this really kooky path from A to B. Obviously we almost never draw it like that. We almost always draw it just as a straight line, but it's important to remember that the path could be really complicated. Um, and this realizes the intuitive idea in homotopy theory that if you give me two points on a surface and they're connected by a path, 
I should be able to sort of squish my space and I should be able to contract that path in order to bring them to this name point. So if two points are connected by a path up to homotopy, they might as well be the same point, right? That's why we think about contractible spaces as being the same as a one point space because you can just contract everything down to one point. Um, and so that notion in homotopy theory of two things are the same if they're connected by a path is one of the things that makes this theory go burr because uh, it's the same as a proof of proper equality. Okay, um, why stop there? So if I have two paths from A to B, I should be able to come up with a path H of type P equals Q, right? A equals B is a type, P and Q are inhabitants of that type. I should have a path between them. And indeed I can. So here's A and B. Here are paths P and Q from A to B. And H is a homotopy between them. So you can think about if P and Q form a circle, like a, a copy of S1, then H fills in the two-dimensional disk inside of it, right? The only way a homotopy can exist is if there's no hole in the space. Um, okay, why stop there? So now I have two points A and B. I have two paths P and Q. I have two homotopies H and K, which you want to think of as being the upper and lower hemispheres of a sphere. Um, you'll have to pardon my um, lack of artistic abilities, but you should you should view this as a sphere where my top my top hemisphere is one disk, which is given by my homotopy H. My bottom hemisphere is another disk given by my homotopy K. And then what do I do? Well, some path from H to K fills in the ball. So now, now I, have, I have filled in the ball and I have something three-dimensional rather than its boundary, which is two-dimensional. Okay, but why stop there? And of course the answer is because I can't draw four-dimensional pictures. Um, I'm already pushing myself to draw three-dimensional pictures, but mathematically there's a better answer. Don't stop there, right? And so types are uh, infinity groupoids, which brings me to section two of the talk. What in the hell does that mean? <laughs> so let's take a second to talk about what infinity groupoids are, why we should care, um, because they're really not as scary as people make them out to be. Okay, so recall a groupoid, um, which is a good place to start if we're gonna talk about infinity groupoids, is a category where every arrow is an isomorphism. So you can see I have some objects in this category, I have some arrows between them, and I've chosen to draw these arrows as isomorphisms. And that's all a groupoid is. It's some algebraic gadget, um, which is slightly more geometric than other algebraic gadgets because sort of everything in category theory plays this dual role of geometric and algebraic. Okay, so this is an algebraic representation of all the less than one dimensional information about a nice topological space, right? If you give me a nice topological space, I can form the fundamental groupoid. Then how do I build the fundamental groupoid? Well, I make a category. I give one point or one object for every point in my space. And I give uh, for every, uh, what are arrows between my objects? Arrows between my objects are exactly paths in my space. And so this fundamental groupoid sort of captures all the one dimensional information about my space X. Um, okay, similarly, given a groupoid, we can build a nice space. For every object, I add a zero cell. For every morphism between objects, I add a one cell. So here's like a little picture. And, you know, is this a picture of the groupoid or is it the picture of the groupoid's associated space? And of course the answer is yes. <laughs> so um, it's impossible to tell these things apart. And you can see this by the fact that this actually gives us an adjunction between uh, nice topological spaces and the category of groupoids. Okay, so now uh, we know what groupoids are um, and we can use them to study topological spaces. So, uh, yeah, we're now going to try to capture more information about our topological space at the cost of making our algebraic gadget more complicated, right? So the complexity has to come in somewhere. Um, this is kind of analogous to studying homology groups instead of studying homotopy groups. Um, homology groups are a worse invariant, but they're much easier to compete with. It turns out that groupoids are a worse invariant. They only capture the one dimensional stuff about our topological space, but they're easier to compute with. Um, but if we're interested in studying all aspects of the topological space, it turns out we can do that faithfully if we pass to infinity groupoids. So a set is a discrete groupoid. So it's a, it's a category whose only arrows are the identity arrows. Um, and we think about that as being a zero groupoid. It recovers information about the points of a topological space, um, but it doesn't recover any of the actual topology. So it's not super interesting. Um, a groupoid, we think of as being a one groupoid because we allow one dimensional arrows between things. And a two groupoid, 
not only do we have points and arrows, but we now also have two isomorphisms. So in the category of categories, for instance, you can think about these as being natural transformations between functors, between categories. Um, but for us, you want to think about them geometrically as being two cells which are bounding a path or which fill right um, some, some boundary that you have in your space. Um, so, yeah. oh, is there a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you said a couple slides ago, uh, nice topological spaces. Yeah. What work is nice doing there? Yeah, like not much. Doing? So any, any class of topological spaces that homotopy theorists care about will work. For instance, CW complexes are nice. Um, yeah, so think about your favorite cell complexes. I'm actually gonna write that in a handful of slides. Um, I don't know precisely how gross your spaces can be and have this still go through. CW complex is definitely enough. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so, and you can see, and again, I'm gonna bring this up in a, in a slide or two, that this feels like we're building a CW complex, right? You give me my zero cells, and then you give me my one cells, and then you give me my two cells. And does this look familiar? Of course it does. An infinity groupoid allows n plus one isomorphisms between the n isomorphisms for all n simultaneously. So you just keep doing this. And this is exactly like a cell complex in topology, like I was just saying. So, um, you know, you have your zero cells, your one cells, your two cells. And anytime I have a boundary of one cells, I can fill it in with a two cell if I want to. And anytime I have a boundary of two cells, I can fill it in with a three cell or like 19 cells and 20 cells and so on. And you just never stop. Okay. So, Infinity groupoids are algebraic gadgets. Um, that's one of the things I want to keep emphasizing. So there should be some notion of a free infinity groupoid if you give me some generating data. Um, we'll come back to that. OK, so section three, equivalences. So logically, it would be really nice if whenever I had some proof that A equals B, if I have some proposition that depends on A and some proposition that depends on B, they should be the same, right? This is the indiscernibility of identicals. If I do some substitution, it shouldn't matter in my logical system. This is like the, the weakest thing that you want equality to satisfy. Um, and it turns out this is true, but rather interestingly, we need univalence to prove it. Um, another thing we need univalence to prove, which is in a similar vein to this, you actually can't prove function extensionality. It's consistent without univalence that function extensionality fails, which is kind of interesting. Hey, Chris, I, isn't, doesn't um, transport my map prove this? Do we need univalence there? Yes, we do need univalence. So transport will give us an equivalence, but in order to turn that equivalence into an equality, that's exactly what univalence buys us. Uh, gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. <coughs> and it really is an important uh, feature. It's possible, again, with, uh, it's consistent with the negation of univalence that um, you can have two things which are intentionally equal, wait, extensionally? Yeah, which are extensionally equal. So uh, they look the same, they're equivalents, but they're actually different. So they're, they're not, they're provably not equal inside uh, types. But of course, univalence um, squashes all of those pathologies. Okay, so let's start easier. And this is going to be exactly what you just brought up. So if I have a proof that A equals B, can I get a proof that P of A implies P of B, right? That should be like a nice, easy thing to do. So can we prove it? And what does it mean geometrically? So if I have a path between A and B, Oh, sorry, I, I should have put this on the slide, but yes, we can prove it. And as is often the case, understanding what's happening geometrically is going to be integral to the proof. Okay, so if I have a path between A and B in my space A, and I have a fiber P of A and a fiber P of B, then what I'm really doing is I want to find a path upstairs that lies over my path downstairs. If I can lift my path in A to a path in the total space, connecting these two fibers, then transporting X along this path will exactly give me a point inside of P of B. Um, and that's exactly what I wrote down in purple. And so this tells me that not only are type families covering spaces, they're actually really nice covering spaces. Um, they're fibrations. So any path downstairs lifts to a path upstairs. Um, and we prove this by path induction. And again, this is one of the places where path induction just feels magical. Um, because it suffices to prove it in the case that I'm just going from P of A to P of A, and then just use the identity function. And somehow proving it for one fiber sort of automatically proves it for every fiber at once. Um, and it's worth meditating on why that works. Um, okay, so 
if uh, P has type A equals B, we have maps P star, which take me from the fiber at A to the fiber at B. And we also have P inverse star, where of course uh, equality is symmetric. So if I have a path from A to B, I can just walk backwards and get a path from B to A. And so P inverse, if I transport along that, that gives me a path from P of B to P of A. And these are obviously inverses, right? If you like, that's the computation rule for um, transport. Um, so this tells me I have an equivalence between P of A and P of B, which again is exactly what you were mentioning earlier. So um, gold star. Um, and okay, I wrote this in black on gray because I really want you to ignore it, <laughs> but I do like feel pressured to say something about it, but like, please ignore it. It's not, it's not important. Um, this is not actually how we define is equiv in the hot book, having two inverse maps with homotopies between them. Um, it's enough data to guarantee equivalence, um, but for technical reasons, we want is equiv to be what's called a proposition. We want is equiv to not have any higher homotopy data. Um, and so it turns out this definition of is equiv ha might have higher homotopy data. And so we don't use it. We use a subtly different version. This is enough to guarantee equivalence. I'm never going to say a word about this ever again. Uh, read chapter four of the hot book if you're interested. Um, OK, so intuitively, an equivalence A equiv B says that A and B have the same information, right? Because I have maps going back and forth between them. And if I go back and forth, then I get the identity, or I'm homotopic at least. And if I go forth and back, then I'm homotopic to the identity. So we can convert back and forth between A and B without losing any information at all. So for instance, one plus one, where one is the unit type and two is the type of Booleans, they should be equivalent. Because if I have in left of star and in right of star, I can map those to true and false. You know, I have true and false, I can map those to in left star and in right star. And it's really easy to see that these are mutually inverse, and so we're golden, right? Here's a harder example. Let's define Z1, so this is going to be one possible definition of the integers, to be the naturals plus one plus the naturals. So I have two copies of the naturals and one singleton. Or I could define Z2 to be sort of the classical construction where I take pairs of natural numbers and I mod out by some equivalence relation that says that addition does what you expect. Um, so here is the classical definition that you're probably all familiar with. And here we think of the left naturals as being the negatives, one as being zero, and the right naturals as being the positives. So why do we care? Well, we can define, you know, all of the nice operations that we would like to have for Z1 and Z2, right? We can define plus, we can define times, but these structures, they should be the same, right? They have the same amount of information. We would expect them to sort of contain the same data. We shouldn't really care about the implementation details. You know, um, but there are still reasons to prefer one over the other. Uh, this Z1, right, this naturals plus one plus naturals has really nice normal forms. So if you're actually trying to compute with these objects, then if you get some, if you run some computation, then it will tell you in left of seven. And it's really easy to read off negative seven from that, you know, um, but it's tricky because if I ever want to define a function on n plus one plus n, I have a ton of cases because I have three cases. Like, let's say you want to define addition. I have three cases for my first number. I have three cases for my second number. Within those cases, if I'm in the right case, I'm either zero or successor. And in the left case, I'm either zero or successor. And it's a hassle. Nobody wants to write this function, but you could in theory. Conversely, if you look at this definition of n times n mod some equivalence relation, it's really easy to define the operations. You do the operations pointwise, you show they respect the equivalence relation. This is exactly how we always do things classically. The problem is that the normal forms are kind of annoying, right? Now my normal forms are some pair of natural numbers, but it's actually an equivalence class of pairs. And it would be nice if we could convert between these two. Um, well, spoiler, what we do is we show that Z1 and Z2 are equivalent. And then anything that I prove for one, I can sort of, I can, eventually it's going to be transport, but I shouldn't be using the word transport yet because we don't have univalence, but we can transport this between the structures, right? Anything I prove for one, I immediately have proven for the other. So as a simple example, if I want to define addition in the complicated setting, well, I move, if E is the equivalence, I move to the simple setting, I add there, and then I move back. It's exactly what you expect. And as a slightly trickier exercise, this one gets two stars. What happens to the proof of associativity? How would you, how would you transport a proof of associativity along this, or commutativity, or whatever I wrote down? How do you transport a proof of commutativity along this equivalence? Um, it's worth thinking about. OK, so meta-theoretically, it's clear that we should always be able to do this, right? If you give me um, two types and their equivalents, and you give me some proposition on one type, 
I should always be able to get a similar version of the proposition for my other type by taking my proposition, transporting along the equivalence, doing the thing over here, and transporting back, right? Um, again, I shouldn't be using the word transport, but we're going to be allowed to use the word transport in a second. Um, and is there a way to tell the logic about this so that we don't need to do it by hand every time? It's really annoying. Like, obviously, I can always do this. It would be really nice if I could get my proof assistant to realize that I can always do this. Uh, and the answer is yes. Drum roll, please. And of course, we all see where this is going. The univalence axiom exactly solves this problem. OK, so there's an obvious map. If I have that A equals B, right? So A and B are actually equal. There's an obvious map, which I think the book calls ID to equiv because um, the book is really good at coming up with clever names. So ID to equiv takes A equals B and spits out A equivalent to B for all A and B in the universe. Um, and this is the obvious thing, right? Here's a like a one-star exercise, build it. Um, it's a really quick exercise in path induction. You're just doing path induction on the universe. Um, and what the univalence axiom says is that there's a section to this obvious map. So actually this map ID to equiv is an equivalence between A equals B and A is equivalent to B. And there's some computational content to the invalence axiom as well, which I've omitted from the slide because it clutters things and we're not really gonna need it in the rest of the talk. But the idea is that um, transporting along a path that came from univalence is the same thing as applying the equivalence. Um, so transport along a path from univalence is exactly what we were doing on the previous slide, but now automated. You apply univalence, you can transport whatever, and everything works. OK, so in a slogan, A equals B is equivalent to A is equivalent to B. And again, there's slightly more here. It tells us what the equivalence is. Um, the forward direction of the equivalence is ID to equiv, this obvious uh, construction by path induction. And the backwards direction is the univalence axiom. OK, but what is this bias? Why do we care, really? Well. Let's start with a proof that A equals B. Then I know that P star, we showed this like a couple of slides ago, and it was brought up as well um, from someone over there. If I have P star, then that's a proof that P of A is equivalent to P of, a, P of B. Well, by univalence, that actually tells me that P of A equals P of B. And I precisely recover indiscernibility of identicals, which is logically quite nice. OK, let's see a slightly trickier example. I have n plus 1 plus n, and this is equivalence to you know, this classical product construction. So the univalence axiom applied to this uh, isomorphism. So I now, I only have to construct this equivalence as an equivalence of sets, right? And as soon as I have that this is an equivalence of sets, um, any structure I can put on one, I can immediately transport to the other. So if I have a construction P on the integers, uh, I can transport along this construction and get uh, whatever it's called, an equivalence between uh, the structures. Okay, let's think about group. So I can write down the type of all groups. And what's the type of all groups? Well, you give me an x in the universe. Uh, that's a typo. Uh, if you want things to work right, x should be a set. Um, but I guess I, hadn't, I haven't really talked about what sets are. Um, but yeah, OK. So you want x to be a set. Um, ignore that. But x is a type, and that type doesn't have higher homotopy data. You pick out an identity in x. You pick out a multiplication from x squared to x. You pick out um, some i from x to x. And you assert that all the group axioms hold. So you can actually write down the type of all groups is some like tuple where the first entry is the set, the second, third, and fourth entries are all the data of a group, and the other entries of the tuple are exactly um, the proofs that the group axiom holds. Okay. Um, so I can say uh, I'm I'm not going to write down the proofs in my tuples. Writing down tuples for algebraic structures is already annoying, so I'm not going to write down the proofs. But you know, pretend these tuples are twice as long. Um, so saying that these two types are equivalent is exactly saying that the two groups are isomorphic. So what is this bias? And this is like one of the coolest things philosophically for me is that means if I have an isomorphism from G to H, I can hit that isomorphism with univalence and get an equality in the type of groups between G and H. So every proposition which takes a group and spits out something, any construction I can do to groups immediately agrees on G and H. Because if I do that construction to G, I can transport that along the univalence of phi and get the exact same proposition or the exact same construction applied to H. And those two things are now provably equal in the theory. So questions that don't respect isomorphism aren't even expressible inside homotopy type theory. So you get these uh, people all the time. I don't think it's a particularly convincing argument. 
but you get these people who say like, oh, type theory is better than set theory because you, you know, nobody ever asks you like, is, is three a member of pi, right? Or, you know, they, they use membership in ways that membership is not made for. And um, this is one of the things that type theory is good at is type theory doesn't even allow you to ask those questions. Um, so any question we can ask of two groups immediately respects all the group isomorphism properties. Um, and similarly for other algebraic gadgets. Okay, um, so another thing that's kind of neat is univalence decides K. So remember K told me that every type is a set or equivalently, uh, there are no non-trivial paths. Um, and this ends up being false intuitively because univalence gives me a new way of getting paths, right? If you give me some equivalence, that's a path now. So as soon as you know that there's some non-trivial equivalence that immediately buys me a non-trivial path. Um, and here's a cute little exercise. Show that set, which is the type of all sets, is not a set. So this is something that you sort of expect for Russell paradox reasons. And univalence again shows that this is the case. Um, as a little hint, uh, consider the type of Booleans. Negation is going to be an equivalence from the Booleans to itself. So the univalence axiom applied to negation is a non-trivial path in set. Um, OK, so with that out of the way, um, you know, what does this mean geometrically? <laughs> You know, uh, uh, this is going to be the question throughout the talk. But to say what this means geometrically, um, we're going to need some types which are more obviously geometric, which brings us to the next section, which is higher inductive types. Um, oh, uh, I guess now is maybe another good place to pause for breath. Uh, do people have questions about uh, anything that we just went over to do with univalence, to do with sort of transporting structures, um, why that's interesting? Uh, I think I'm seeing some head shaking. Oh, is that a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, so what you just said about like in homotopy type theory, you can't distinguish between two groups that are isomorphic as groups. That There seems something wrong with my intuition about this, that when I think about like, um, the dihedral group as symmetries of some shape. And I think of it as like, its elements are the symmetries, uh -huh. like they're functions from the plane to the plane. That's a different group than the multiplicate, the abstract multiplication table that is a, you know, a different presentation of the same group. That am I just like stuck in a pre- homotopy type theory world where I see the difference between group presentations as different groups that happen to be isomorphic? No, 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 absolutely like, not. Uh, <laughs> in, fact, in fact, like this actually has, like, I'm really glad you asked this actually. Um, yeah, this it, is real oh, mathematical just, content. Too. I just want to finish uh, like something I want you to specifically address. That, sure. So like when I think of the group, like it has as part of it is a set, the set of elements. So if they have a different sets of elements, and they're different as sets, mm -hmm. they have to be different groups. Like that's ah. part of my intuition. If like the set of elements is a different set, even if it's an, a set of the same cardinality, if two groups have different sets of elements, then they're different groups, sure. even if they're be isomorphic. Yeah, sure. So, so what, oh, sorry. No, you go. So I, I, just to pile on on that objection, <laughs> like, like in cryptography, everything that they do, a lot of it at least, is like on a cyclic group of order, like of a prime order, which is pretty trivial. But, but then again, if it were that trivial, if representation didn't matter, we couldn't have sent our you know, credit card numbers over, over the internet safely. But we yeah, can. Yeah, totally. So, so there's something there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one example, and again, this is like a fantastic question. So one example that I think uh, really showcases this is for instance, uh, look at the complex plane, okay? Now fix a lattice in the complex plane, okay? That's, uh, that's Z squared, right? But of course choosing, and so abstractly they're isomorphic as groups. If you pick just like the standard like orthogonal lattice, which I will attempt to draw with my hands, okay? That is just Z squared. Or if you pick some like slanted lattice, um, that's also z squared. Um, and so abstractly, these are isomorphic. Um, but we would expect to have, for instance, the quotients of C by these lattices to be different complex structures on the torus, for instance. Um, or there's other things as well. You know, you can think about um, um, if you have two groups, 
you can have two isomorphic groups with two isomorphic subgroups whose quotient is not isomorphic. And that's like a very obvious group theoretic thing, um, which is ostensibly not preserved by this. And the reason is that both of these things are not just concerned with groups. They're concerned with groups plus a fixed embedding of that group into the complex numbers or a group plus an embedding of a group into another group, right? And so there's some bonus data that you're keeping. If you think about group actions, for instance, the, the action of the dihedral group on, a, on, let's say, a square, right? Versus the action of the dihedral group on, oh, uh, let me give a different one. Let's say the action of dihedral group, the, the D6 or D2 times three on a triangle, right? versus that's abstractly the same as a symmetric group on three points, just acting naively on three points. Or if you want to be really wild, acting on the basis vectors of some vector space. These are obviously different, even though the groups are abstractly isomorphic. And again, the, the trick and the difference between them comes with the fact that it's not just a naked group. It's a group equipped with some action. It's an abstract group equipped with some, you know, some homomorphism into a linear group or with some homomorphism into a symmetric group or something like that. And so any question that we can write down that only uses the group axioms will be preserved. So if you ask me, for instance, is this group abelian, then that is necessarily preserved. And I can ask that question using only the data of group homomorphisms. But if there's another question you ask me, which is, for instance, what's the metric structure on the quotients, then now, I don't just need the group. I also need the embedding of the group into the complex plane. Or if you ask me what's the quotient of these two groups, not only do I need the two groups, I need the data of the embedding between them. And so that gets me out of this problem. Um, yeah. Um, and as for the thing with sets, um, yeah, I think that that is uh, not the way that homotopy type theorists think about things is if you give me two sets or indeed categorically minded people or generally, if you give me two sets, frankly, I don't care about what their elements are. Um, the only interesting question you can ask about a set is what its cardinality is. Um, and so that's obviously me being flippant. There's other interesting questions. Um, but as far as, as far as most group theorists are concerned, I don't think many group theorists think about um, two different sets with the same group structure as being properly different groups. Um, again, if you look at two different groups with the same group structure with different embeddings into some, you know, they act differently, then okay, those are different objects. But that's again something that homotopy type theory yeah. can be correct. Yeah. They... Yeah. I, don't, um, I, didn't, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to start an argument, but the, <laughs> the part where like they wouldn't consider them different groups is because they're like passing to the skeleton of group. Like, right. They define a group as like a set X. I mean, sure. even you just did, right? They yeah, set sure. X and then, right? And then they're like, oh yeah, but quotient by all group homomorphisms. Like, right. or group isomorphisms. Yeah. For sure. And the univalence yeah. axiom allows us to do that formally, right? Because now under univalence, yeah, I have to pick a set because I need something to carry the group structure. But now these two things are provably equal. So it really didn't matter what choice I made. Um, yeah, so they're not isomorphic in, under univalence axioms. They are properly equal. They are the same element of the type. Um, okay, um, I should probably move on, but that, like I said, that was a fantastic question. I'm glad we clarified that. Um, and if you wanna ask more about that after the talk, I would be happy to like chat about this more. Okay, um, so higher inductive types. We're now going to move on to some slightly more geometric notion of type. How do we define the natural numbers? Well, um, zero is a natural number. And I have a successor function from the naturals to the naturals. And I do this freely in some sense, right? So what do I mean by freely? Well, one way of formalizing freeness is if you give me some x naught in x, you give me some sigma from x to x, then there's a unique function from the natural numbers to x, which you know, does the obvious thing, right? Um, in general, inductive types give us a way to define new sets in the universe, right? Um, and there's some, OK, anyways, I won't belabor that point. Is there an analogous way to define types with higher homotopy structure? Okay, and the answer is that surprise tool from before is going to be precisely what solves this problem. So definition by example, um, because actually formalizing higher inductive types is quite tricky. And so I'm not qualified to do it. Um, so I'm gonna give a handful of examples and hopefully you uh, get the gist of it through the examples. So let's define the circle. Let's define the type S1. So there's going to be a base point. So there's a point in the circle. 
there's also going to be a loop from base to base. So now not only am I allowing generators inside my set, so like before I had zero has type natural and I had some set level functions that my thing had to respect. And now also I'm allowing myself to add generators at higher homotopy levels. So I add a generator called loop, which is uh, inhabiting base equals base. Okay. And I define S1 to be freely generated by these. So, okay, what do I mean by that? Well, one definition of freeness is in the same way that the naturals, not only do I get zero and the successor of zero, I also get the successor of the successor of zero, right? And all of these have to be different because the object is free. And if they were the same, then I would be able to, right? Uh, there aren't allowed to be bonus relations between these. Similarly, not only do we get loop, we also get loop compose loop, which is another path from base to itself and loop cubed. We also get loop inverse, right? And all of these things have to be different because the object is free. Okay. Um, so another way to phrase this is if you give me a point in X, and if you give me a path from X to X, then there exists a unique map from the circle to X, which sends the base point to the base point, and which sends the loop to the specified path. Okay. Um, APD, you might remember, is action on paths for dependent functions. So that's um, why we write it that way. Okay. Um, another way to phrase this uh, pictorially is we have base. Um, we have sorry, loop. Chris. Yes. So we, we, we talked about AP, but not APD. Do you want to maybe say something quick about APD? Yeah, APD is exactly the same as AP, but it works for dependent functions. So actually, since I'm assuming X is just a type, um, then we can get away with just AP. I wrote APD out of habit. When we have types into the, when we have functions from S into the universe, we actually need APD because now it's a dependent family. Um, but yeah, it's it's action on paths. But now you have to worry about transporting along fibers. That's that that's the only the only difficulty. Um, I forget where exactly in the hot book it is, but um, it's not tricky. If you imagine that I'm writing AP everywhere, nothing changes. Okay. Um, so we have a base point, we have a loop, um, and this is exactly how we define the circle in homotopy type theory. So let's see another example. Let's uh, define the torus. So V is one point here. We have two paths A and B. So A is a path from V to itself, and B is a path from V to itself. And then we also have a homotopy saying that AB equals BA. So it's a two-dimensional path connecting if I go around AB, that's the same thing as going around BA. Okay, so that's a little bit tricky to visualize. So maybe this is more clearly drawn as, um, you know, this diagram that you all have probably seen before. The only difference now is not only do we have a two cell, but my two cell is like oriented in some sense. It takes me from AB to BA because it's a path in this space. Okay, um, but it's a torus. Um, oh, and as a cute little exercise, um, I should have written this down probably, try to prove that S1 times S1 is equivalent to the torus. Okay, um, it's not hard. Um, so what does this have to do with univalence? Well, let's start small. So how do we know that loop is not refl, right? That's an obvious thing that we would like to know. The loop of the circle should not be able to contract down uh, to the do nothing path. That's like the one thing I know about the homotopy type of the circle. Um, so how do we prove this? Well, we can do it again, as is always the case in homotopy type theory by blending logic and geometry. So recall, recall, recall not, which is a type two is equivalent to two, right? So it flips true and false inside the type of Booleans. And we think of the univalence axiom applied to not as being a path from two to two in the universe, right? So now let's define P, which takes uh, S1 and spits out a universe. So this is a dependent type on the circle where I send the base points to the Booleans and I send loop to, the, to this equivalence. So this path from two to itself. And now I'm going to flex my drawing skills. This did take me like a half hour. We have, so here's the base points and the circle. We could uh, pick uh, two points over the circle, true and false over base. And then we're going to draw this path here where I start at false. And remember, transporting around loop, right? Or sorry, transporting around the univalence axiom of not, doing transport on that is exactly the same as applying not. So if I start at false and I transport around this path, I get to true. And if I start at true and I transport around this path, I get to false. OK, so this is sort of the standard double cover of the circle. Um, I'm going to leave it on the slide because I spent time making that. Now, uh, we know that if I do the action on paths to REFL, that has type 2 equals 2. 
And if I do action on paths to loop, that also has type two equals two. Um, but if, if I have some property from two to the universe, then transporting along that path, if I transport along uh, the path given to me by REFL, then that sends me from B of X to B of X. But if I transport along loop, then that, remember, transports around this negation function. And transporting around the negation function uh, just applies the equivalence. So now this gives me a function from B of X to B of not X. Okay, so the first one is just the definition of the action on paths, right? If you go through the definition of path induction, it tells you what to do to REFL. That's the computation rule. Um, and this thing on loop is the computation rule for univalence. Again, um, you know what transporting along a path given by univalence does. It exactly applies the equivalence. So uh, a slightly tricky exercise, flush out this proof. So can you take this argument and turn it into a proper proof that it's not the case? I guess I'm being a little bit sloppy. This not is different from this not, right? Um, but OK. So can you prove that not loop equals refl base? And the idea is going to be like if you take b to be the identity, then now this would give me a proof that x is equal to not x. And there's a problem there. OK. Um, as a bonus exercise, this is a different proof from the one given in the hot book. But formally, is it the same proof? So can you find uh, a path between the two proofs? I actually don't know the answer. Um, I think that it's the same proof. Um, but I haven't, I haven't thought about it too hard. So um, that's a bonus, a very tricky question, if you want to think about, think about that. OK. Um, so another exercise. Um, let's let S1 be defined by these guys. Um, so intuitively, it's another circle, but it's a circle with two marked points. Prove that this is the same thing as the classical circle. And prove that the total space of this vibration, so we have the double cover again, prove that the total space is the same thing as this. And then using this, show that the this double cover is again a circle. So it's a double cover of the circle by itself. Um, so now you can see we're doing proper homotopy theory. And at basically, um, at lots of steps of this procedure, you're going to need univalence. Um, so um, you need univalence in order to do um, interesting homotopy theory. Um, is that true? Okay, maybe you actually don't need univalence for this. Maybe you only need higher inductor. Okay, I haven't thought too hard about this exercise, but I might have just lied to you. Okay, anyways, contrast this um, with this other vibration Q from S1 to the universe, where we send base to two, and we send loop to the path that two is equal to itself. So now transporting along that doesn't change things, and this is sort of the disjoint double cover. And it's, again, it's a cute exercise to prove that this total space is the same thing as S1 times two, which is the same thing as uh, two copies of S1. Okay, um, so let's kick things up a notch. Um, let's define helix now. So helix is going to be a map from the circle to the universe, which sends the base point to the integers. And I think you can all see where this is going. And where do I send loop? Well, I send it to the path which is given by Z is equivalent to Z by incrementing one, right? So if I translate to the right by one, that's an equivalence from the integers to itself, at least as a set. And so if now going a long loop sends zero to the equivalence, which is zero plus one. Similarly, one gets sent to two. And of course, we get the entire helix in this way. And this is exactly how we compute the fundamental group of uh, S1 in homotopy type theory. If you want to see more about this, uh, check out chapter eight. There's also a handful of really great talks that do this. Basically, the entire talk is computing the fundamental group of the circle uh, with all the nitty gritty details. Um, I don't want to do that, so I won't. Um, but that's, uh, that's roughly how you use univalence in practice in order to do homotopy theory, is it lets you translate equivalences into these paths. And then using these paths, you can you know, do homotopy theory. Like, we crucially use univalence here. So geometrically, univalence is really nice. And also logically, univalence is really nice because it decides a lot of these, um, a lot of these otherwise independent statements in homotopy type theory. Uh, and it decides them in a way that's satisfying. Right? So suddenly, indiscernibility of identicals is true. Functional, uh, function extensionality is true, et cetera. Um, OK, so conclusion. Uh, from here, we can start doing homotopy theory, uh, which is really awesome. So we use higher inductive types to define cell complexes. You can do this sort of generically. Um, a quick warning. Um, I don't think I put this in the slides. Yeah, I didn't. Um, but be a little bit careful. Um, you can get surprise uh, homotopy groups when you generate um, free infinity groupoids. So for instance, um, 
if you try to define the circle or the sphere, so define the two sphere um, as a free infinity groupoid with a point and a path from REFL to itself to give the surface of the sphere, uh, it turns out that even though you have a zero dimensional generator and a two dimensional generator, you actually get higher, um, higher homotopies um, present. So this is um, basically the hot vibration. Um, and so you have to be kind of careful about um, how you go about doing these things. Um, it's possible for all of your generators to be of dimension less than three, say, um, and yet still, uh, even though all your generators are of small dimension, you can end up with um, higher homotopies in your type, um, which is really interesting and really complicated. And that's one of the reasons people care about this stuff. Um, so you can use, so, you know, I should have mentioned that on the slide, but I didn't. Um, you can define suspension and loop space and a bunch of other constructions from uh, homotopy theory. And moreover, everything has computational contents. So here's a kind of cute application of this is Brunery's number. So uh, Brunery showed that there is a, in homotopy type theory, proved there is a K so that the fourth homotopy group of S3 is Z mod KZ, right? So again, this is what I was talking about. Oh, maybe the example was, uh, was uh, three and not two. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a homotopy theorist, so I might have misspoke a, a slide ago, but this is what I meant. You can see that magically there's a higher homotopy group um, than you would expect from the fact that S3 is three-dimensional, you can still end up with higher stuff. Um, and what's cool about this though is, so this is called Brunery's number, kind of as a joke. Um, and we can run this proof as a program. Um, remember, Existential statements in homotopy type theory necessarily include a witness to the existential statement. So if there exists a K making this true, we can run the proof as a program and learn that K is actually equal to two, right? You can just run it and you look at the output and it says K equals two. Um, unfortunately, current implementations are too inefficient. So it always, every time we've tried to run it, our computers run out of memory. Um, or if you write it in a way which is slightly more memory efficient, um, then you know, you'll wait until the heat death of the universe or whatever. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, thankfully, oh, frowny face. Okay, thankfully, there are lots of people studying this kind of stuff. Um, so there's people studying univalent foundations. So for instance, Joyal is doing good work in this area. Um, there's people using univalence for homotopy theory. Emily Real is of course doing really great work in this area. And there's also people like Dan Lakeda, um, trying to make efficient implementations of homotopy type theory so that when we do all of this magical stuff using univalent foundations, we can actually use the computational content in a reasonable amount of time um, and much more. So that puts a smile on my face compared to the frown from the last slide um, because now is a really, really cool time to be studying anything to do with univalence really. Um, and yeah, that's the talk. So I right, thank Chris. Okay, uh, so yeah, questions about things. So let me ask a really naive question before other people can ask more intelligent questions. Um, so univalent axiom, does it, the slogan you gave, is it really all it says that equivalence is equivalent to identity equality? Yep, that's literally what the univalence axiom says. The univalence axiom says that ID to equiv, so that map sending the identity uh, between A and B, to the equivalence, it says the univalence axiom says exactly that that map has a section. Um, okay. So that map has a right inverse. Then what's the sort of the defense or justification why why we want that axiom? Oh well, um, again, it decides a lot of uh, logical things. So it decides k, um, it decides function extensionality, it decides other things that I've forgotten, um, and it decides it in a satisfying way. So that's one reason that you might be interested in it. Um, another reason is because it allows you to prove things that we want to prove in homotopy theory, right? It's really useful in homotopy theory. Um, I think the univalence axiom actually came, so Vovodsky is the person who came up with it. And I think he actually came up with it initially from a point of view of homotopy theory, where I forget why it's called the univalence axiom, um, but it has something to do with some other notion of a univalent object in a category or maybe a univalent category, I don't remember. Um, but univalence is a very natural thing to consider from a homotopy theoretic perspective. And then it was porting it over to homotopy theory. Um, and this subtle technical difficulty with the definition of is equiv is sort of uh, wrapped up in trying to make um, univalence consistent even. 
the naive notion of univalence where you have this other definition of is equivalent is actually inconsistent. And so that's why you need this little uh, technical definition of is equivalent in order to make univalence consistent. Um, and we do have models of it. So there's, um, so we know it's, we know it's consistent. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Other questions about stuff. No, okay. Um, let's thank Chris again. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was lovely being here. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> I guess maybe, maybe next semester. Uh, we're, we're thinking about maybe continuing the semester, seminar next semester. So maybe we'll have you flown out. Oh, you know, maybe. Very cool. Yeah, that would be awesome if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, let me know. Um, yeah, I love talking about this kind of stuff. So yeah. All right. Um, I'll let you all get off to dinner. Um, I'll maybe stick around for like five minutes in case there's people who have questions that they didn't want to ask on the recording. But um, yeah, other than that, yeah. Thank you all again so much. Uh, take care. Enjoy your Wednesday. Thank you.